وسع ربي كل شيء علما أفلا تتذكرون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another of our regular Q&A sessions we are taking questions from yourselves some of these questions have already been submitted others will submit as you're watching the video inshallah and we have uh, some of the AMAU team with us to select some questions which are important which have been asked by many people and I will do my very best to answer them inshallah ta'ala so perhaps we can start with our first question inshallah Zakhallah khair shaykh one of the students Abdullah bin Faisal asks I've started lacking in consistency please help Barakallah fiqh there's no doubt that one of the great challenges that the Talib Ilm faces is the challenge of consistency. And if I wanted to describe this challenge to you, I'm going to describe to you someone who's been memorizing the Quran for 15 years. Look back. The Quran is 600 pages. Each page has 15 lines on it. It's not a big ask, right? You could have done it in a t- you could have even done a line or two lines every single day, and you could have achieved it. You really could have memorized a lot in that time. But what we see is the person was trying to memorize three, four, five pages at a time, and now 15 years on, and they still haven't memorized. Consistency is extremely important. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "Ahabul a'mal ila Allah adwa muha wa inqal aw kama qal." The most beloved deeds to Allah are the most regular, even if they are small. One of the things I believe will really help you to achieve consistency, wallahi, go back and watch the videos on ta'zim al-ilm. Go back and watch the introductory videos. Wallahi, if this book doesn't help you. After Allah Azza wa Jal, I don't know what will help you after that. Because this really contains, wallahi, a reminder for everyone. You must be consistent and you must strive for consistency. Wallahi, it pains me when I see students dropping out of a course, joining another course, dropping out of that course, joining another course, dropping out, I'll do it next time. Wallahi, it pains me. It pains me to see this from the students, wallahi. And it's not good, it's not a good sign of a student of knowledge if that person is not able to work on and striving for consistency in your worship. Lord of the heavens and the earth and whatever is between them. So worship him and remain consistent in worshiping him. Do you know anyone who is comparable to him? I think in Ta'zim al-Ilm we have chapters on consistency and ta'anni, taking things slowly. If you're trying to take every of one of the masarat all at the same time, you're trying to take it all together, it's going to confuse and maybe even it's going to be too much. Take what you can, take it slowly and stay with the program. And I would like to add to that one point, it's not really part of the question, but I feel it's critical, wallahi, is that people need to trust your teacher to guide you through the program. I see two problems. I see a lack of consistency among some students. I also see al-isti'jal or al-ajala. I see people just rushing. When can we do this book? Why haven't we started reading Majmu' al-Fatawa? When will we start doing this? Why are we still on the madkhal? Ikhwani, trust your teacher. Trust your teacher. Don't trust me. No problem. I'm your brother, Muhammad Tim. Trust Sheikh Abdul Rahman. Trust your teacher to guide you through what you need. Don't say, I want to bring this. You people are rushing. Mankind is always trying to rush things. So we see one group of people rushing and another group of people dropping out. And wallahi, the khair, al khair, kullu al khair, all of the good is in the middle. Khairul umuri awsatuha. 
Be in the middle, be consistent. Take your three hadith a day, your one little video a day, your 10 minutes, your 20 minutes, and just stay with it. And trust your teacher. And, and after you put your trust in Allah, that you have a plan and an organized program that is inshallah ta'ala gonna get the best out of you ta'ala. That doesn't mean we don't want comments and, and suggestions. We, we love that to students to give their thoughts and their feelings and feedback. I really want to avoid these two extremes. And they are extremes. Al-Ifratu wa tafrit One of them is going too fast. Why can I not do the advanced books? I want to do this book. I came to the Madras to Umariya to study the Ummahat al-Sitta, the six major volumes of hadith. Why are we still here sat on talking about what's a hadith and what's a sunnah? Slow down. Slow down. Take it easy. Walk with your teacher. And inshallah, you'll reach your destination. And as for those people who are not being consistent or who are struggling with dropping out, Wallah, go back to Ta'zim al Watch the videos again. Internalize what was said about taking things slowly and being consistent in what you do. Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, three masail every day. Three masail. Three things he learned every day. Can you not learn three things a day? But you try to learn 50 things and then the next three months dropped out. I joined another course and Wallah, he just slowly and remain with your teacher and insha'Allah ta'ala Allah Azza wa will deliver you to the destination that you want nah. well, the sister asks you said one source of aqidah is taken from authentic hadith what if there is a difference of opinion from the scholars on whether a hadith is authentic or not can it cause differences in matters it's an excellent question. There's no doubt that one of the reasons for differing, and if you're studying the madkhal ila ilm al-fiqh, the introduction to the science of fiqh with Sheikh Abdul Rahman, he's going to be talking to you, or he's already spoken to you, about asbab al-khilaf. What's the reason for differences of opinion? One of the reasons why we have differences of opinion is because of differences of opinion over the authenticity of the evidence. That's one big reason we have a difference of opinion. Now, generally, aqidah suffers from this less than fiqh. Have you ever thought why that might be? The reason is, is that generally the evidences in aqidah, and I mentioned this in my aqidah introduction, the evidences are different to fiqh. In fiqh, you could have one issue. And that one issue has many evidences. Each scholar reaches that conclusion from a different world. So imagine fiqh, like there are hundreds of roads to this that arrive at a building and different scholars are taking different roads. In Aqidah, it's very rare. In Aqidah, normally there is one single evidence that everybody gets behind and the other evidences support it. So it's a different approach. And I actually quoted you from Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, what he said about this, or if I didn't quote from you, I, I mentioned it in passing, that Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, clarified this, that the style of evidence is different between aqidah and other things. And that's why there's rarely the same huge differences in aqidah that there are in fiqh, even though people differ over the authenticity of a hadith, Generally speaking, people tend to get behind one single evidence that they all agree upon, and then things go from there. But there could be, um, there could be, for example, the name of Allah Al Muhsin. Uh, this is some of the things some of the scholars didn't affirm it because they didn't see an authentic hadith for it. And uh, I think Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Al Abbad, also Sheikh Abdul Razak Al Abbad, also they have some commentary on this and they show that the name of Allah Al Muhsin is authentic for Allah, but and mostly in Aqidah, people are standing behind one clear, undoubtable evidence. That's a difference with fiqh where maybe people travel on many roads, some of them better than others, but try to arrive at the same conclusion. And I mentioned this in one of the, uh, the introduction to Aqidah in the difference between Aqidah and fiqh. Yeah. And Allah knows best. Zakhlah khair, Sheikh. Uh, a sister has posted a question multiple times asking when will the beginners uh, level come out for the students of knowledge program and she's been waiting. When will the beginners level come out for the student of knowledge program? 
So one of the things what I have mentioned already is that it's very important that you don't rush. Now, we do understand that some students are more advanced than others, but I honestly believe that you can take so much benefit from the madakhil. These madakhil are not even madakhil, they are uloom in their own right. Anyone who look, looks at these madakhil, this madkhal to aqidah, madkhal to fiqh, anyone who's looking at those uloom and thinks they are just like some basic notes, well, they didn't, they didn't look at it properly. If you look at this properly, you will see that these uloom, they are, there is knowledge in there. There are thing, quotes, there are details, there are usul, qawaid, principles, there are names and dates, there are histories, there are, there are vast amounts of information. I, I'm not going to say that there's no, that every student would say, I've, you know, for example, I would believe majority have not heard it before. But maybe one or two students are well studied. We have some very advanced students with us at Al Madrasa Turmaniya. And we appreciate you being there. Uh, those who say, look, I've taken this from the Mashaykh. Everything you said in the Madkhal I knew. But even then, how many areas are there for research? How many opportunities are there for you as an advanced student? You say, everything Muhammad Tim said, I heard it already. I know it already. I, you know, he's just telling me something I already know. No problem. How many opportunities are there? And then I would ask you the question. If you feel you know it, do you know all the masarat like that? And if you're so good at aqidah that you just, everything that I mentioned in the madkhal, you know it already. What about fiqh? What about hadith? What about lugha and adab? What about tazkiyah to nafs and manners? All of them, you feel you know them perfectly already and you didn't benefit anything from them? This is, it's unlikely that you find a student like that. And generally, you just need to wait, be patient, and let the course develop. But there are students more advanced than others. I'm not, I'm not taking that away. There are students who want to get into the books. Don't rush. Stay in the madkhal. Find all the things that you can research. Many times, you know, I read I read ayah. I didn't read the tafsir. Go to the tafsir of the ayah. Bring out all the benefits you can. Go to your research. Your advanced student. Go to your books, bring out the benefits for yourself. Consolidate this knowledge and make it solid as a rock. And we will get to the book, inshallah ta'ala. Kullu atin qareeb. Everything which is coming is near. But we want people to follow the program. And ultimately, we want to make it clear that as I said, your teacher is the one who is guiding you and you are not the one guiding your teacher. That's basic adab. And if the student didn't take that adab, go back to ta'zim al and take that adab. Because if you don't have that adab, wallahi, you will not take ilm. You will not get knowledge at all. Mustahil that a person gets knowledge that benefits them without adab, without manners. It's not possible. Without the etiquettes of knowledge, you cannot get it unless you bring the manners that come with it. It is mustahil, impossible for somebody to get beneficial knowledge without getting, first of all, the etiquettes of it. So go back to Ta'zim al Understand that there is a benefit in us doing this together as a group and understand that this is a methodology and a manhajiyah which has been set for you by someone that you chose, you wanted to be your teacher. So follow that manhajiyah and trust in it after Allah and inshaAllah ta'ala, you will get what you want. Don't worry about it, it will come. It will come to you, inshallah ta'ala. Zakallah khair, Shaykh. One of the sisters asks, what is the difference between fitra and intellect? Or are these words synonymous? No, definitely they're not synonymous. Uh, the two are different. So if we talk about al-fitra wal-aql, al-aql is something that Allah gives you by which you are able to perceive and understand the world around you your intellect. As for your fitrah, it is an inclination that Allah places within you, a tendency towards something or a, uh, a feeling of something. So if you ask me the difference between fitrah and firasa, that's a little harder 
because firasa is is an intuition. Fitra is not an intuition. It's something Allah placed within your heart that causes you to incline towards the truth and to appreciate the truth biljumla la bitafsil in a general way, not in a detailed way. For example, your fitra cannot tell you that Al Muhsin is a name of Allah. Does that make sense? Your fitra can't tell you that Al Muhsin is a name of Allah. It can't. But it can tell you that Allah has names and attributes. When I hear Allah say, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَةِ فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُ الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَاءِ To Allah belong the most beautiful names. So make dua to Allah with them and don't deviate. It's like my heart just settles upon it. Yeah, that's the truth, Wallahi. That's what is easy upon my heart and my nafs. That's the fitrah. As for the aql, this is rationale, this is thinking now, processing. Afala ta'qilun. Do you not think or reflect or use your intellect to understand that which Allah Azza has said to you? Afala ta'qilun. So those are the differences. As for firasa, firasa is a sudden intuition you have about something. For example, somebody may come to you and you're like, I don't know, I don't see something wrong with this person, but I just don't feel like this is a good person for me to be around. Some of that could be fitrah, like your natural inclination, you saw like bad manners or you saw like uh, a lack of religious observation. But even if you didn't, firasa is just something like an intuition, just a feeling you have is not good for me. Or, you know, a feeling like that this, is, this person is, is, is not right for me, for example. That firasa is an intuition. You don't see the reason for it. As for fitrah, fitrah is your natural inclination to incline towards something and the general observation of what is right. For example, as we said, generally observing that Allah has names and attributes and feeling right about that. Whereas the aql, it processes the information that you receive. So the wahi comes to you, the revelation, it gets processed by the intellect, which is between the, the, the brain and the heart. As Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah ta said, and through that you process and reflect upon the revelation that is given to you. Bear in mind if someone then says, well, does that not support the idea that the aql has a precedence over the revelation? It doesn't. And it, Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah gives the best example for this. Imagine a person who is sick. This person who is sick finds a wise person in the village, in the town, and says, uh, I'm not feeling well, and you're a wise person. Could you recommend for me where I can go for someone who could give me a medicine? He says, of course, I know exactly the right doctor for you. Go to the city, and you will find a doctor who will really give you the best medicine. So then the person comes back after a while from visiting the doctor and says, you know, Jazakallahu khairan for your advice. I went to the doctor, he gave me this medicine. The guy said, don't take that medicine. Said, don't take that medicine. I, it's, I, I don't think it's good for you. Hold on a second. You recommended me the doctor because the doctor is the expert. Now the doctor gave me the medicine. You don't have the right to go against the doctor now. You, Jazakallahu khairan, you showed me the doctor, but you don't have the right to now overrule the doctor. You, if you were a doctor, I would have asked you. This is the example of the person who gives precedence to the intellect over the Qur'an. The intellect brought you to be able to understand the Qur'an and to be able to appreciate its value and its truth. But once it brought you there, the Qur'an is what you need and not to override it by your rationalizing about things and reflecting about things and so on. And I hope that makes sense, inshaAllah ta'ala, about the difference between al-fitrah wal aql والفراسه ان الله عز وجل نوز بيست جزاك الله خير شيخ سيستر فاطمه اسكس استاذ از ات ا باد ايديا تو تيك اول ذا باث واي ات ذا سيم تايم اند اف يس وات وود يو ريكومند اس تو تيك افتر عقيده اند فقه اتس ا فيري فيري جود كويشن اي دونت ثينك اتس ا باد ايديا اند اي اي وودنت هاف بوت ذيم لايف اف اي ثوت ات واز ا باد ايديا اونستلي اي وودنت هاف بوت ذيم لايف اف اي ثوت ات واز ا باد ايديا تو دو ذيم ات وانس بوت اتس نوت فور ايفري وان Some people have the time and the commitment and the energy to do them at once. 
and they enjoy. I mean, some students are sad that they say, Wallahi, some of the, our students, I am, I'm just honored, Wallahi, for them to even be on the program. The people we've seen preparing notes and studying each video and going through it multiple times, writing down the evidences, collecting their notes, revising them, memorizing. Wallahi, it is, it is Wallahi, it's an honor, an honor for me, Wallahi, to eat, for them to even join the program. To have someone who's so dedicated to knowledge like that. Uh, we ask Allah to make us all people who are dedicated to knowledge and give knowledge its right. So I don't think if someone's got that dedication and we, you know, and the time and the energy to do it, there's no harm in it. But if you see yourself struggling in that, don't be frightened to pause some of the masarat according to the, the different pathways, according to what you see from your own time. If I was to recommend, Allah, how can I recommend Allah? Like they're all, they're all so good. I mean, I have loved, really, I have loved teaching uh, tarbiyah. And we're doing al-madkhal ila makarim al-akhlaq. And wallahi, I've just, it has been a pleasure, a pleasure from the pleasures of this dunya, wallahi, just to sit and teach makarim al-akhlaq, the noble manners. And I've loved it. But is it more important than the Quran? No, you know, at the end of the day, or the sunnah, they all have their importance, right? And they're all extremely important. But if you, I mean, I would say makarim al-akhlaq is uh, the tarbiyah uh, pathway, personal and spiritual development, it's easier than the others. It's a little lighter. It's a little lighter. So if you feel like you just want like half a topic, just to, you know, like enjoy it a little bit, but fill in your time, but you don't want to take on another heavy topic, then, maka then uh, spiritual and personal development is very good. But if you feel like you need, you can take on something heavyweight after aqidah and fiqh, I think that, you know, the next thing to take on is absolutely the Qur'an. You know, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, uh, it, you know, the, the Qur'an and the Sunnah, those, those two. So it depends. If someone says, look, I only ha I have room for three heavy subjects, you know, tough subjects. Aqidah, Fiqh, and maybe Qur'an. Somebody says, you know, I can take one more, I can take Sunnah. I can't until then. But if someone just wants a little filler, like something just a bit lighter, but something which is still another pathway, they can take uh, personal and spiritual development. I'm at least I'm finding it very, uh, very enjoyable. Inshallah, Taala. And there's so many. I mean, Sira is Sira is another one that's not too heavy, but it's very, very. It changed your whole life, whole life. So there's a lot to recommend. Uh, people asking about how quickly will we move on to the beginner levels. Uh, it, it, I would say in Aqidah, we will move quicker than other sciences. Because Aqidah, I'm about halfway through the Madkhal. Then I have another Madkhal introduction to Al-Firaq wal iftiraq uh, sects and sectarianism. And that's a little shorter. Uh, so I think out of all of them, it might be Aqidah moves quicker to the books than the others. Because in my timetable, I see that I'm due, I'm scheduled to move in Aqidah a little quicker than the others. Uh, sunnah and Fiqh are very long, the introductions, because there's a lot of things we need to introduce. Narrators of Hadith, Al-Jarh Al-Ta'adil, Mustalah Al-Hadith, all these different things. And uh, in some of them it might be shorter, like uh, Akhlaq also, spiritual development. We should start the books quite quickly. Now, another point I just want to raise on this issue of the books. See the Madkhal as like your first lesson on the book. Don't see the madkhal as like just this like collection of notes. See it as this introductory topic. See it as the first chapter of your book. I'll tell you how my mashayikh used to do it. For example, my sheikh is teaching thalatha to usul. Uh, he's teaching al-usul al-thalatha. When he's teaching al-usul al-thalatha, the first few weeks he makes an introduction to aqidah. He calls it al-usul al-thalatha. We still bring the book, we open the book. But so far, I've only written on the cover of the book. I haven't written on the, I've written on the inside cover. I haven't written anything on the text of the book itself because the sheikh has just explained the introduction. So see it like that as well. That might make it easier for you. Like, okay, I understand. This is like the first page, what you would write on the first page of the book. It introduces the topic and everything like that, inshallah. Now.
احسن الله اليك شيخ ستودنت سيز اي ام نيتيف عربي سبيكر بس اي دونت نو ماتش اباوت عربي جرامر اند اي ام ويك ان فوكابولري دو اي نيد تو اتند ذا عربيك وذ ام يو كورس اور از ماي ليفل سفيشنت تو كونتينيو وذ ذا ستودنت نوليدج بروجرام اي ثينك يور ليفل از سفيشنت ان شاء الله اي ثينك ذا ام يو عربيك كورس وود بي تو ايزي فور يو بس اي دو ثينك that you would benefit perhaps from some of the resources within it maybe but i think if you for example if you were to do uh sheikh abd rahman's uh masar uh, uh this uh, language pathway i think you're going to you're going to get what you need inshallah if you want to improve your vocabulary honestly it's a matter of just exposing yourself to content videos audio uh, listen to the mashayikh read the books go through and write you know what the words mean and it can be a little difficult to transition from uh, arabic which is spoken at home to arabic which is spoken in the masjid or arabic which is spoken by a teacher but the fact that we have english there to support as well i think you'd be absolutely fine i don't think you need to start the emu arabic course at all in fact the emu arabic course is probably designed to help people get to your level rather than to help you it, it's to help people to get to the level of a native speaker even if they are not specialized in islamic or in classical arabic so i think uh, there may be elements of the course you would benefit from but to be honest most for example a native speaker who says i've grown up talking to my parents in arabic i speak to them in arabic we have conversations but my vocabulary is limited to the house and you know what we have for dinner and i don't i don't really have that wide vocabulary if you start reading newspaper with a dictionary if you start um doing more things in arabic if you start asking words writing down vocabulary maybe three months and your arabic is right up there you know better than you know better than ours inshallah so it's it's just a matter of just build that vocabulary and make sure you take the lugha uh pathway with Sheikh Abdul Rahman and I think you'll you'll definitely reach uh, where you want inshallah without the Arabic course inshallah and Allah knows best Zakallah khair Sheikh sister asks do subjects like belief in jinn or believing in the five daily prayers or believing in al isra wal miraj come into aqeedah or would believing in five daily prayers for example come under fiqh hmm. uh there are sometimes aspects which come under multiple topics so the obligation of the five daily prayers is a fiqh issue right fiqh deals with uh the things that are wajib and the things that are mustahab and the things that are mubah the things that are makruh things that are haram the fiqh, fiqh deals with those things you know what's obligatory what's recommended what's permissible what's disliked what's haram that's what fiqh deals with at the same time there are aqeedah issues regarding the prayer like what is hukmu tarik salah for example what's the ruling of the one who leaves the prayer or the one who is jahid they deny the obligation of the prayer this can come under some of the rulings of iman and kufr is it kufr is it mukhrij min al millah for example some of these issues could come under aqida issues to a certain extent and they also spoken about in fiqh the scholars speak about in fiqh abwab about the hukum of the person who leaves the prayer that's a fiqh issue but they could have aqida aspects to them as well in some aspects so i would say if you're talking about the hukum of something what's the ruling of this action if you're talking about the ruling of an outward action the primary place you're going to find it is fiqh primarily if it has deviant groups that went astray because of it or there is a danger of deviancy because of it you will find that in aqidah let me give you an example prayer is an outward action right it's an outward action and the ruling of your outward actions is dealt with in fiqh that's the very definition of fiqh fiqh deals with that so the ruling of leaving the prayer the ruling of praying all that is going to be is going to be found in the books of fiqh even ridda apostasy in terms of rulings is going to be found in the book of books of fiqh but what might you find in aqeedah 
issues where it comes into the concept of iman. What is iman? What is disbelief? What extent, to what extent is something considered disbelief or not? Uh, to what extent does disbelief make someone a disbeliever? This you will find in Aqidah because it's, it comes under what? The concept of Iman. The concept of Iman. So that's with regard to the prayer. With regard to the jinn, uh, the world of the jinn is an interesting one. Where does it fit into? If I were to fit it anywhere, I would more likely fit it into Aqidah than anywhere else. The reason for that, even though it, it has elements in tafsir, in hadith, but the reason for it is, it's part of the ghaib, which you can't see, which Allah commands you to believe in. And so it's more likely to be kind of attached within aqidah. And even if we look at books, uh, even though it's its own subject in a way, but if we look at a lot of books, uh, they are written from an aqidah point of view, the world of the jinn, the world of the unseen, the world of the jinn and the angels. So I would say maybe it's from those things that are mulhaq, attached to, just like, you know, footnotes to the topic of aqidah, the world of the jinn. What was the third thing? Sorry, so it was the world of the jinn, the prayer. Al-Isra wal miraj So al-Isra wal miraj is what issue? First of all, first and foremost, it's as, it, you find it in seerah, right? The story of what happened. But where might you find believing in Isra wal Mi'raj in the topic of Al Iman bir Rusul? Believing in the Prophets. So again, if it's a matter of belief, some people say, I don't believe in Isra wal Mi'raj. The Isra wal Mi'raj was just a dream, it wasn't real. That's Aqidah. Which part of Aqidah is it? It comes under believing in the Messengers. Believing in the Prophets and Messengers. Al Iman bir Rusul. And taught me Nabi Lahi wa Malaikatihi. وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُلِهِ Believing in the Rusul, the messengers. That's where it comes in there. So does that make sense how you find things? And this is why we say at AMAU, the sciences of Islam are mutadakhila, mutarabita. They come in together and they mix with one another. You can't say seerah, seerah, don't study anything else. Like, do you see how it is? Seerah, yes, but then the belief in it is in aqidah and the ruling of it is in fiqh and the you know, details of it is in tafsir. And it's mentioned in the hadith. Islam doesn't come separated like that. That's why eventually we want you to take all of the masarat over time so that you get that comprehensive view. But learn which element is in which subject. For example, like we said, if you want the ruling of an outward action, it's in fiqh. But if you want to know it from a belief perspective, like the book of fiqh says, فَقَدْ كَثَرْ disbeliever. What does disbelief mean? And who is a disbeliever? And what are the conditions and the impediments of it? Aqidah. In what? In the concept of Iman. The, cha the chapters of Abwab al-Iman. The concept of Iman. What does Iman mean? What's Iman? What's Kufr? That's what we're just about to cover in Aqidah. Maybe we're about a month away from you guys. I'm just about to start sort of... Uh, Preparing all of that, I mean, the concept of Iman. So that's something we're coming to. What's Iman really? What's Kufr? You know, if someone commits Kufr, when are they Kafir? That's Aqidah. Isra wal Mi'raj is Seerah. But if you want to know the authenticity of the Hadith, it's in Hadith. And if you want to know what it means to believe or reject it, it's in Aqidah because that's belief in the Rusul, in the Prophets. So hopefully that makes sense, inshallah, and Allah knows best. Zakhlah khair, Shaykh. Yeah. Uh, sister asks, how can we deal with people praising us for our knowledge? We know they don't mean bad, but we also know the reality of ourselves. How do we deal with this? I think there are a number of ways. And I think I really like what the, was a sister who said. I really like what the sister said. Wallahi. She said, we know our own selves. And this is the first point wallahi, that I would, I would say to every single person. If you know yourself, the praise of people and their criticism, it matters less to you because you know yourself. The poet, he said, Wallahi, law alimu qabiha sarirati, la abas salama alayya man yalqani. He said, wala mallu suhbati, he said, wala a'radu anni wa mallu suhbati, wala tu ba'da karamatin bihawani. He said, Wallahi, if you people knew my secret self, 
you wouldn't even give salam to me. And you would have turned away from me and become bored of my companionship. And I would have taken on disgrace after I had been honored. لكن سترت معايبي ومثالبي وحرمت أن سقطي وعنت غياني But oh Allah, you kept concealed my flaws and my deficiencies and you forgave my failures and my transgressions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lahu alhamd All praises to Allah. So a person knows, Allah, when they praise you, you look at them like, Allah, he person who is ignorant who are you praising Allah if you, if you saw the inside of my heart you wouldn't even give me salam let alone praise me how can you praise me so you discourage people from praising you but the best thing is the dua Allahumma la tuhasibni bima yaqulun waghfir li lima la ya'lamun waja'anni khayran mimma yadhumun aw kama qal close to that oh Allah don't take me to account for what they say. And don't, Allahumma la tuhasibni bima yaqul. And forgive me for what they don't know. And make me better than they think of me. And that's what I would say. If somebody says a word of praise, I would say, Oh Allah, don't take me to account. Allah, don't punish me, Yawm al Qiyamah, because of what this person said. This person said, You know, Wallah, people say things. I'm scared for them, wallahi, when they say it. The way they praise people. And I just think that, wallahi, we just ask Allah, oh Allah, don't punish me for what this person says. And forgive me for all the things this person doesn't know about. And make me even better than what they say about me. And that's very important. And I also think that people who are quick to praise you are quick to criticize you tomorrow. You know, subhanAllah, they become, it's like Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Habib habibaka hawnan ma, asa an yakuna baghidaka yawman ma. And he, love the one you love with balance. Perhaps they'll become your enemy tomorrow. And hate the one you hate with balance. Perhaps they'll become beloved to you tomorrow. You see people who have a lot of praise, tomorrow they are the people who will shoot you down the most. And like Ali Imam Ahmed said, if a person knows them, their own self, the praise of the people and the criticism of the people doesn't benefit them. I would say to someone if they praise me in front of me, I would say, you know, may Allah reward you for your kind words, but this praise is, is not good. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned it, why would one of you? And he kill their brother. You would kill your brother because of this. And he commanded to throw dust in the face of the person who praises you. But just, you know, don't... What I saw from our mashayikh, there's a beautiful video. It was the video of uh, Sheikh uh, bin Baz. Sheikh bin Baz. Wallahi, it is... Allahu Akbar. If you find this video, do you have, find me the title of this video, please. Sheikh bin Baz, this video. Sheikh bin Baz, Wallahi. This brother sits. Sheikh, he sits. And he gives this... Praise of Sheikh Bin Bas. And he says he is the one whose words are heard all over the world. And he is the one who is the defender of the Sunnah. Sheikh Bin Bas took the microphone. He said, may Allah forgive this brother for what he said. I ask Allah to forgive this brother. He said, we have so many flaws and deficiencies. Allah is beautiful what he said. Sheikh Bin Bas reprimands, reprimands a man for praising him. What's on, on YouTube? Okay, yeah. People of Knowledge YouTube channel. Just have a look at that clip. Well, it's subtitled in English. You will be amazed. Sheikh Bin Baz. The people say he's the mujaddid. Allah sent him to revive the ummah. Any people believe, and this is, any wallahu alam, I believe this to be true. Allah sent Sheikh Bin Baz, chose him after the hundred years to be a reviver who brought Islam back to this ummah. And wallahi, look at the humility when the person praises him. And a similar thing happens with Sheikh Muthaymin and Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr. Sheikh Abdul Razak praises him and Sheikh Abdul Razak gets upset with him. And he says to him, Hasbuk, Hasbuk, be quiet. Shh, stop it. Fa, this is something you know, worth, worth benefiting from. Wallahu alam. Zakalakhir Sheikh. 
one of the uh, sisters asks, as a student of knowledge, I know we must implement what we learn into our lives, such as respecting our parents to the highest degree. What advice would you give to someone who struggles with this? Well, it's so true. How do you... I think the first thing is, the first thing is, wallahi, it is recognition. To recognize that there is work to be done. I recognize that I need to implement this knowledge. If knowledge is not implemented, it's closer to being a punishment than a blessing. So it's got to be implemented. And at the end of the day, realizing that knowledge will change you. Something amazing was said about one of the uh, mashayikh, students of Sheikh Al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, the Sheikh he used to go, he used to have a, quite a, a hot temper. Hafizahullah uh, ta'ala. Sheikh is still alive. He used to have quite a hot temper. He used to be you know, known among his co colleagues, like his students. He was a student at that time. You know, a little bit, you know, rough with the people. They said every year he would visit Sheikh Al-Albani in the summer. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And he said every time he would come back, he would just come back with better manners, you know, calmer, kinder, more ta'anni, uh, taking his time over things. And they said this continued for every year that he would go to Sheikh Al-Albani and he would spend time with him. And, and he, he was blessed to have Sheikh Al-Albani and Allahu Musta'an. Uh, we don't have that today. But what we can do at least is to give you some of that knowledge that would change you and also to be able to connect you to the scholars who when you sit with those scholars, that's the thing that changes you from your manners and behavior. Just recognize it needs to be done. Ask Allah's help. Make dua. Ask Allah. Allahumma ahdini li ahsan al-akhlaq la yahdi li ahsaniha illa ant wasrif anni sayyi'aha la yasrifu anni sayyi'aha illa ant oh Allah guide me to the best of manners nobody guides to the best of manners except you and take me away from the worst of manners nobody guides to the worst of nobody keeps away from the worst of manners and nobody keeps people away from the worst of manners except you and make the dua Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha وَزَكِّهَا أَنْتَ خَيْرُ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا أَنْتَ وَلِيُّهَا وَمَوْلَاهَا Oh Allah, give us, give my soul its taqwa. And purify my soul. You're the best of the people. To, you're the best of those who purify it. And you are the one who is the guardian of my soul. And you are the one that I entrust to take care of it. This, these are from the beneficial du'as to improve a person's behavior. And then try to practice. You know, I'll tell you something, just a small tip, because I know time goes on and we have a lot of questions, but small tip. When it comes to practicing what you know, it's easy to practice what you know when things are easy. It's not easy to practice what you know when things are tough. So when you have a parent who is very, you know, heyinun, leyinun, sehlun, qarib very easy going, very relaxed, very approachable, very gentle. So this is not birr al-walidin, yani this is easy. This is not even, you can't even call this birr al-walidin. Yani it's just, it's easy because the parent makes it easy. But when you have a parent who's sometimes tough on you and makes it a little hard for you and maybe isn't where you would like in terms of practicing, then it's hard. Now we see where is the birr. Now show me the birr. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا uh, the, the ayah, if they compel you to make a partner with me, don't obey them, but accompany them in this world in the best way. Keep on learning, keep on refining, keep on working, keep on making dua. Every time you fail, وَأَتْبِعِ السَّيِّئَةَ الْحَسَنَةَ تَمْحُوهَا Follow up the bad you did with good. It'll wipe it out. Go back to your parents. Sit at their feet. Apologize for what you did. You know, give them a hug. Say, you know, kiss them on the forehead. Say, I'm sorry. I was a little bit rough. I spoke out of turn. Forgive me. And then even if they berate you, I never forgive you. You are a wasted child. And smile at them and say, may Allah make me better than what you hoped. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all and 
you know, be gentle with people. And my my tip, wallahi, and it's not my tip, it's from the Quran, about how to deal with difficult people is the statement of Allah Azza wa Jal, وَلَا تَسْتَوِ الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا السَّيِّئَةُ إِذَا فَعْبِلَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِيمٌ وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُوا وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا ذُو حَظٍ عَظِيمٌ Allah says the good deeds and bad deeds are not equal. Respond in a way that is better. If you do this, it will be the person that there is some enmity between you and them will become like the closest friend. But nobody can do this except those who are patient. And no one can do it except those who have been given a great portion. And if shaitan makes you slip from that high standard of character, say, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم For Allah is the one who hears everything and knows everything. So always respond in a way that's better. If someone insults you, make dua for them. Say, may Allah Azza wa Jal correct me and may he correct all of us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor me and honor you. And be kind and gentle in your words. Always وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً And if you ever feel like you're slipping from that sabr, فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ Seek Allah's refuge from the shaitan ar-rajim. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Zakallah khair, Sheikh. Wayyakum. We had a few students who mentioned that the, the, there is a break in the stream. So they can just go to the settings of the video because other students find it fine. So they can just go to the settings of the video and change the quality of the video to a lower resolution so that they can watch it clearly because it depends on their local internet speed. Definitely. It's one of the challenges of live streams. But I believe the video is also recorded for the students. Yeah. So there'll be able, anything platform. that they missed, they would be able to go back and catch it. We all have those problems. We have it here. We have it there where we have the... The internet connectivity issues just lower the quality of the stream. You'll be fine, inshallah. Uh, we have some questions regarding the routine in the, in the life of a student of knowledge, and this has already been addressed in the introduction program before the, the madhal. Sheikh Abdul Rahman addressed yes. it. Yes, yeah? so they can go back and watch. Very it. good. So go back to what Sheikh Abdul Rahman said. If you still feel you have questions, try and write them specific questions down. So I always prefer if a student says to me, "I've watched your video on Ta'zim al-ilm." But I still had these three questions versus someone who says, you know, uh, how do you achieve knowledge? You're like, well, we made videos on that, right? So let let the students, inshallah, go back to the video. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, what's the, do you know what the video is called? Or the, like the part of it where the, ad advice, advice to the student of knowledge. So Sheikh Abdul Rahman has an introductory part of the academy called advice to the student of knowledge. In there, you can find about the routine in the day of the student of knowledge, inshallah. But if you have specific questions after that, write them down, especially if you can address them to Shaykh Abdul Rahman, it would be very good. And Allah knows best. Zakallah Sheikh. Also, we have a few questions that are not related to the topic and generic questions, so they can use the amu.org slash get in touch link to post these generic questions. Okay, uh, like fiqh questions and things yeah. people have, yeah, definitely. So fiqh they can and use and gin related okay, questions. Rukia and gin related questions. Yeah. Okay, so those are a lot. Inshallah, those we, we do some, have. Uh, the, and some out of topic speak. questions that are not related to the program. No question. Uh, I think one of the brothers is a bit upset that his questions are not being ignored, and he feels that sisters are be, being given precedence. Uh, that's not the case. We're just going with whatever, uh, yeah, in, in terms of the priority related to the class only. So. Okay. So please don't be upset, uh, yeah. Khwani, if some of the questions are answered and some are not. We have many people asking and we have to try and group questions together and prioritize and look at some, some things over others. So honestly, I don't mind if we give a little preference to the sisters also. Didn't the Prophet say, Rifqan bil qawarir, be gentle with the fragile vessels. Well, I'm about to say any. Ithar brings you in. Wallahi, I'm going to teach something we learned from Manas. Ithar, ala anfusihim walaw kana bihim khasasa. What did Allah say about the Ansar? They give up what is their right for others, even though they need it. Wallahi, you will never ever lose out from this. If you give up to someone and say, you know what it is? I had a question, but tafadl, ask your question. Wallahi, you will never lose out. Allah will give you many times over what you what you left when you give up something for someone else. Uh, it's a profound lesson, Wallah. And it requires bravery, as we learned in the Madhal ila makarim al-akhlaq, learning about good manners now. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. 
uh, students ask is it important to do the introduction to studying with amu before going into the subjects i do believe it is very important to do it yes even if you know i i totally understand we have students at different levels i completely understand that some students feel like they might have done it before but the knowledge in there to be honest is more important than a lot of the things you will learn afterwards for the reason that it tells you how to study and if you know how to study even if tomorrow you were not with amu but you were studying by yourself or with a sheikh or with an institute or with whatever as long as as long as you know the method for study be in allah ta'ala if you apply yourself and you ask allah's help you'll be successful but if you don't know the method for study wallahi you can study tafsir and quran and you can sit at the feet of mashayikh kibar big sheikhs you can sit at their feet and it will just go straight over your head so it's really important for you to take that module even if you feel like you know a lot of the things just take it zoom over it add any benefits like i said a lot of times people know something so i've taken it no problem take it again and anything that wasn't mentioned or you want to expand or research take the time to do that inshallah it's very important zakalak yes i have a question it says i had problems understanding qadr since before i have been exposed to philosophy what do you suggest me to do in order to understand and grasp it better I would start with a very very simple explanation of qadr uh without going into the tafasil or the details of it and for example there are what they call maratib al qadr al arba the four levels of qadr now i've explained this quite a few times but i'm trying to think did we cover it in any amu videos up to now um i certainly have it if you just search on youtube for muhammad tim qadr there are quite a few videos where we did just a khulasa a very brief summary of the basics of qadr now i know if you've been exposed to philosophy you're going to be like but 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 like firing a million questions off so that's what philosophy is like but try to just grasp the basics the knowledge of allah allah's writing whatever will happen allah's will and all the issues connected to it and allah's creation and the issues connected to it and then the issue of guidance and misguidance those basic issues just to get them like locked down in your head with the dalil with the evidences with a good understanding i i think if someone does this this is the first step then later you need to ask about the specific shubhat you're going through like okay i've taken maratib al qadr al arba the four levels of qadr allah's knowledge allah's writing allah's will allah's creation with all of the issues that they contain like the issue of why did allah write if he knew what was going to happen and if allah has written why do i have to act and you took all those basic issues and you took a decent understanding of it one hour an hour and a half alhamdulillah then you still say just i just misguidance i don't get it you know i heard what you said but i'm still have issues over allah misguiding people now what you need to do is you need to ask on that specific shubha that you're going through and i would rather answer those kind of things privately because to expose shubha to a wider group of people is not a great idea right it's better to answer the person individually there is that link as well for asking at amu perhaps you could use that that link inshallah ta'ala zakla khair sak yeah assalamu alaikum teacher i have a question uh, in tadim al ilm i did not understand the difference between haram by qadar and haram religiously rest is going good alhamdulillah okay no problem at all i think the best example of haram by qadar is the example of musa not being able to drink milk from anyone other than his real mother now we know that it's permissible for a baby to drink milk from any woman that is chosen by the mom or the dad or the parents agree upon it uh, as allah azza wa jalla said wal murdi'at uh, wal walidat yurdi'na auladahunna hawlayni kamilayni liman arada an yutimma ar-rada'a 
this ayah, it's no, there's no issue. The Prophet ﷺ, Halima Sa'diyah, radiallahu anha, she fed the Prophet ﷺ milk. So there's nothing in the Sharia that makes it haram. But why was it? Why did it not happen? Because Allah declared it to be haram. وَحَرَّمْنَا وَحَرَّمْنَا We made haram upon him all of the marabi, the, the women who give milk to the babies. All of them haram. Was it haram in the Sharia? Was it like Allah says, this is haram for you, Musa, and if you drink it, you're sinful? No, Allah made it impossible. Like Musa could not take it. So Allah made it have made it something that was haram in by his decree, but he didn't make it haram in the Sharia. By in Sharia, Musa could have drank from any woman's milk. But Allah decreed that he would not be able, he would not stand it. And he, as though it is haram in Sharia. So I, I don't know if I'm, I'm making sense there. Uh, if I could think of another good example of something which is uh, haram in Qadr. Yeah, for example, uh, let's just say that Allah Azza wa Jal, what happened in Surah Al-Kahf, for example, with regard to those boys, Allah forbade it that they could take their treasure out until they became older, right? Until they became old enough. Allah made it impossible for them. Like he made it haram. They could not take it. Whatever they would try to do, it would not be able to happen. Is it haram for two young boys to inherit treasure? It's not. But Allah didn't make it haram in the Sharia, but he made his qadr that it will not happen. He declared by qadr, it will not happen. So it became an impossible, forbidden thing for them not because it's forbidden in Islam, but because Allah decreed it forbidden for that person for a wisdom that is with him. So if you can think about it like this, one thing is forbidden by the law of Islam. The other thing is perfectly allowed to do, but Allah forbids it for a particular person for a reason. Does that make sense? So for example, Allah might prohibit someone from earning, becoming a millionaire or a billionaire. Is it haram in Islam? It's not haram. Some of the Sahaba were extremely wealthy. Uthman prepared the, the ghazwa of uh, Tabuk uh, an, almost by himself. And they were extremely wealthy, some of them. But others, whatever happens, he will not get wealth. Allah didn't make it haram in the Sharia, but Allah declared it forbidden for that person in Qadr for a wisdom that is with Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, like knowing that the wealth would cause him corruption or evil, or knowing that it would bring about harm upon him, and so on. And Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Uh, this is just an observation from the team. So once in a while, some of the students, when they ask a question, they say that Abdul Rahman said this, Abdul Rahman said that, uh, without mentioning Ustad. And I know that Ustad does not want to be called Ustad in the first place, but... Uh, what would you advise the students, at least on the platform? Sir? No doubt that if you want to be a student of knowledge, wallahi, you absolutely have to bring the adab of the talib in, the etiquettes of the student of knowledge. And that means addressing your teacher in the right way. Uh, it means, uh, and I know why some people don't do it. Some people, they were affected by the fact that they think that they are uh, responsible or they think about the problems where some of the junior students of knowledge were raised up to a really high standard of knowledge and people got misguided because of that. But this is separate from the issue of adab. There's a difference between calling someone sheikh out of respect to your teacher and there's a difference between equating Muhammad Tim with Sheikh bin Baz. Equating Muhammad Tim with Sheikh bin Baz is a musibah, and it's a calamity. But to call someone Sheikh out of adab and respect and out of uh, good etiquette of the talib with the student, this is essential, wallahi. And I remember I read it's a phrase, like a, like a, a small say, statement. Someone said, you know, uh, an American soldier was writing 
They said, we were trained to even call a lamppost, sir. He's an American soldier. He said, even the lamppost, we salute it. Yes, sir. And even the lamppost, and everything we are told. Wallahi, there's something in that for the Talib ilm. That when you sit with your teacher, even if your teacher is less than you in knowledge, even if your teacher is junior in knowledge, even if your teacher is a da'iya, not a serious Talib ilm, or even if your teacher is a Talib ilm, but not one of the mashayikh al-kibar, still you call your teacher with respect and you give them that respect and honor and dignity that Islam requires from you. Because until you do that, wallahi, it really blocks you from seeking knowledge. It's bad etiquette. It's bad manners. And it doesn't help you develop as a student. That is different from the issue of raising your teacher to, you know, Al-Allama, the great scholar of Islam, Al-Hujjatul Baligha, the one who is Allah's evidence on the earth. And this is Ghulu. إِيَّاكُمْ وَالْغُلُوءُ فِي الدِّينِ فَإِنَّمَا أَهْلَكَ الَّذِينَ كَانُوا قَبْلَكُمْ الْغُلُوءُ فِي الدِّينِ Don't exaggerate in the religion because Allah destroyed the people who came before you because of exaggerating in the religion. It's very true. So don't exaggerate in the religion by making someone who is somewhat junior into the greatest sheikh in the world. But give people good etiquettes and good manners and speak to people respectfully and in an appropriate way because you can't achieve knowledge without its etiquettes. And Allah Azza wa knows best. A student asks about reading books as a student of knowledge, but those books that are like non-fiction or history or those books which are written by non-Muslims, what would you advise in this case? There's no doubt that I would advise wherever possible to avoid the books of the non-Muslims. Unless and until your teacher recommends a particular book for a particular reason. Otherwise, wallahi, I would not encourage it. There are so many issues and, and always the aqidah of a person comes out in their speech. I believe that the aqidah of a person comes out in their speech. So I would honestly advise you, do not take from the books of the non-Muslims about Islam. Uh, if you read their books about things that are not connected to Islam, you know, 10 tips to be productive, how to develop good habits. Okay, I mean, there are, there are equal or better in Islam, but anyway, it's not the same. But somebody who's like, I want to read a history book or I want to read, Wallahi, my advice is, uh, to stay away from it unless and until your teacher recommends a specific book that you would benefit from or quotes a specific uh, piece of research that you would benefit from. And this is what I saw even from the Jamia Islamiyya, the Islamic University of Medina, that typically these kind of issues would be reserved for masters and doctorate candidates and they would, re they would read the book under the guidance of their tutor and their sheikh uh, before anything else because it is... It's a dangerous field to go in. And likewise, the ulama, they speak about the ruling of learning from a mubtadi, from an innovator. And there's no doubt that I'm not talking about learning innovation from them. I'm talking about like learning Arabic from them or learning Quran from them. There's no doubt if you can find someone upon the sunnah, then this is awla or aslam. It's more deserving. It's more, uh, it's more safer for you. So my advice is the non-Muslim is min babi awla. If we talk about the ruling of the mubtadi', then what about the non-Muslim? Min babi awla. It's more deserving. So don't, don't go into their books. You have in Islam what is sufficient for you. And there's an evidence for that in, in, in what happened with Umar and the Prophet wasallam when he brought some pages from the Torah. And the Prophet wasallam became angry with him. And he said, by the one whose soul my hand is in, if Musa were alive, he would have no choice but to follow me. And he commanded him to leave these pages. So this is an example of the Torah, which came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, versus the Quran. For how about the books of the non-Muslims and their thoughts and their... Yani, with your teacher's advice, there may be some limited things. This has a point about geography in it, or this has a point, but try to minimize your exposure to that and Allah knows best. 
I still have some. We can still okay. go for a couple of questions. Actually. So, sister asks sometimes verses and hadith may be translated or understood somewhat differently. So, if we research it, it might come differently slightly from what you translate. Should we only write them as you say? It's a very good question. Uh, I would say that there are two situations happening. In one situation, what is written is fundamentally different. And in one situation, what is written is basically the same. Like I might have chosen the word, um, I might have chosen, for example, a particular word. Uh, I'm trying to think of a hadith. I might have chosen, okay, actions are according to intentions. Someone else said actions are counted by intentions. Someone else says actions are judged by intentions. Someone else says actions are uh, accounted by intentions. They're all very similar in meaning. Um, there's maybe a better translation, maybe not such a good, but they're all very similar. So you can more or less choose the translation which you think to be the best. But if you see there's a fundamental difference, you have to ask why. Are you reading a riwayah of the, which is different, like a, a version which is different? Or are you reading the same Arabic? And maybe the translation you're reading is not accurate. So I would say in that case, go with what your teacher has said. Uh, it is true, sometimes I quote a hadith from, from, from memory and I might free, sort of freestyle the translation a bit. I might just bring it how I, like I'm reading the Arabic and I just give you my rough translation. But generally speaking, I would say if there's a fundamental, like a really big difference, then I think here you should go with what your teacher said in case you're looking at something different. Like you can sometimes have variations on the hadith and there's a purpose for that particular wording. Nah, and Allah knows best. A student asks, uh, he has memorized 10 juz, but he doesn't really re revise. So what would you advise in this case? Should he proceed further or should we continue with re revision? Or what no, we no, you should, you should do two things. You should revise and you should start slowly to proceed. In other words, you should resume the entire thing. If you only revise, what happens? 10 years later, still revising the 10 juz. 20 years later, still revising 10 juz. You know, and so on. If you start memorizing new, those 10 juz are as though you never memorized them. So what you do, give most of your time to the 10 juz, but give some time to start, you know, when you're having a good day with the 10 juz, give, give some time to start the other, to start new. That way you will progress uh, properly and you'll also revise what is missed. I've got students who, Allah, I see with them in the Quran. I've got students, I'll be honest, who constantly revise all the time. It's just, I'm just revising. I don't want to go further because I need to revise. But that revision never stops. At the same time, I've got people who just zoom, next surah, next surah, next surah, and they haven't revised. Rather, what you should do is start the entire program again. Al-Hifth, Al-Jadid, Wal-Qarib, Wal-Qadim. The three types of hifth. The old hifth that is solid, the hifth that is kind of shaky because you've done it recently, and the hifth which is brand new. And I just believe if you start even a little bit, even if you do like half a page of new a day, but at the same time you are working hard on doing like half a juz every day of revision, well, in a month you're back to where you need to be and you can continue inshallah ta'ala. 10 juz for someone who memorized but is a bit forgetful, I think you can, at least you can manage two juz a month. In five, six months, you're completely back to where you were. But give time for new. So what I would say is if you do six months, in that six months, you might memorize three juz new and revise all of your 10 juz as well. So you'll be like 13 to 14 juz, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah knows best. Zakallah khair, Shaykh. Uh, another thing, Sheikh, is uh, sometimes the, there are questions that are asked and the students try to answer these questions in the comment section uh, even before the teacher answers. Uh, it's not like general like sharing of a link or finding a resource, but specific questions. So what do you advise in this case? Sheikh? It's also an issue of adab, right? Wallahi, there are times, wallahi, I sat at the feet of my Sheikh and wallahi, there was a hadith he couldn't 
recall it or an issue that he said, I've not come across it. And maybe every single person in the first row knows it. And wallahi, we will say, Naam, Sheikh. Jazakallah khayyam. May Allah bless you for it. Carry on. That's etiquette with the teacher, right? It's etiquette with everyone. And I'm telling you now, if you don't have that etiquette with Muhammad Tim, you will not have it with Sheikh Abdul Rahman. And if you don't have it with Sheikh Abdul Rahman, you will not have it when you sit at the feet of the scholars. And if you don't have it with them, you will not have it at the feet of the kibar either. Because if you don't get these etiquettes, we talked about the etiquette of how you address your teacher. The etiquette of not answering the questions. Wallahi. I think the person who answers a question in the presence of their teacher, without their teacher's permission, this is, wallahi, whether they get it right or wrong, they are sinful. That's what I believe. The person is sinful, whether they get the answer right or wrong. Because ultimately, they have spoken ahead of themselves. They have put themselves forward without knowledge. And they are malvinna. They are in danger of speaking about Allah without knowledge. So it's very important that you don't answer the teacher's questions. I even don't think you should answer even admin questions. Like someone asks like, uh, you know, can I get this? Can I get that? You really need to understand this idea of studying with a teacher. And this is a difficult, you know, generally this is a problem for students from the West. We have this problem because students from the West, we sit down with the teacher and, you know, we have a little bit of this tekabur in us, a little bit of arrogance and pride. We sit there, we're like, okay, هذا الرجل وأنا رجل. He's a man and I'm a man. Like, what, what should I do? But if you don't learn it with someone who is junior, you will not be able to do it with someone senior. And wallah, if those manners happen in front of, for example, Sheikh Saleh al he will stand up, he will take his sandals and he will leave and you will not see him after that. That's how it will be. Wallahi, in front of someone like Sheikh Saleh al if someone even like a little bit showed bad etiquettes of, of Talib, Sheikh will stand, he will take his sandals and he will go. He will say, there's la khaira fikum. There's nothing good in you people. I'm going. This is what you will get from the kibar al-ulama. So if you don't learn it with the sigar, how will you learn it with the kibar? If you don't learn it with a small student of knowledge like me, how are you going to learn it with a major student of knowledge? Or with a major scholar? From the you know, major scholars of our time. You need to get these etiquettes locked down. Don't worry about it. Don't beat yourself up about it because it is what we're learning now. This is part of us sitting together. We're learning adab, the manners of being a student. How do you sit on the floor? How do you write? How do you look? How do you pay attention? If we don't get these manners right, wallah, when it comes to the mashayikh al-kibar, you're going to find yourself either kicked out from the class or you're going to find even worse than getting kicked out is the sheikh is going to leave and cancel it. That's what we saw from the major scholars of our time. So be really careful about it. Don't answer the question, even if you know it. Yes, no doubt, you could respectfully suggest something. For example, if the teacher made a mistake in an ayah and he read the wrong ayah, you could say, Sheikh, uh, I wondered, was the ayah like this or did is this the ayah that you meant? I'm just writing it down. Without indicating the Sheikh made a mistake, like without, for example, saying, Sheikh, wallah, akhtat, Sheikh, you made a big mistake. Wallah, I don't know where you learned to read the Quran. Like, not like that. But in a way where you say, for example, uh, Sheikh, the ayah uh, like this, for example, wallah, it's, it's really good etiquette. And honestly, honestly, these etiquettes will last you a long time. They'll last you with much, much more knowledgeable people than me. And if you stick to them, inshallah, they're going to really make a big difference to your seeking knowledge. So it's good etiquettes and good manners and uh, yeah, any part of that is not answering the questions uh, that are put to the teacher until the teacher answers them or until the teacher gives you permission to answer them. And sometimes in a class, I would say, a live class, I'll say, does anyone have the reference for that? Does anyone know the video name for that? Yes, I know the video name. Like that. And wallah, I think if you sit with a mashayikh and you hear how people read questions and how people... You know, speak to the Shaykh, Wallahi, you see the absolute pinnacle of, of good manners.
And this is all mentioned in Ta'vim al ilm as well. So you can go back to that uh, revering knowledge, the course we did in the introduction, inshallah. Shall we take one last question, sir? Yes, absolutely. Okay. A sister says, I'm a mother and can't dedicate alone time to seeking knowledge. I can only do classes with my children. Is this still honoring knowledge? Absolutely, wallahi. You know, I asked this the question to one of the mashayikh. I said, uh, Sheikh, we hear these statements that if you give knowledge, all of you, it will only give you something. And if you give knowledge, some of you, it will not give you anything at all. Sheikh, what do you think about that? Like for someone who's busy, a mom, someone who works, you know, 12, 13 hours a day. The Sheikh, he said, it's not how you thought. He said, Muhammad, you, you didn't think of this the right way. The meaning of this is you give it all that you have. Not what you don't have. Not 24 hours a day. You give it everything that you have. So if you have an hour a day, you give it the hour a day, even if it's hard. And you know, even a mom listening with your kids, how much will your kids learn? Mashallah, ayat, hadith, manners. Look at uh, Imam Malik with uh, Rabi'ah and Abi Abdurrahman, his sheikh. His mom put his turban on him, he's a little boy. His mom put his turban on him and said, just go and sit with Rabi'ah. But learn from him manners before you learn knowledge. And subhanAllah, like you just picking up the kids, pick up how to behave and how to speak. And alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, inshallah. There's a lot of good in it. And even if you had an hour a week or two hours a week and you just sat for that time, wallahi, you give knowledge whatever you have to give and it will give you something back, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah knows best. I think that's about what we have time for. I will obviously apologize to all the students whose questions don't get answered. Well, like every question is logged, is seen, the admin team sees it. Uh, I look through it later on. We'll remember it next time. We try to answer it in videos, in the Institute. Inshallah, your question is not wasted. Don't feel like that. But even when we used to sit with our Shaykh, we would put questions, the Sheikh wouldn't answer our question. Sometimes we get upset with the reader. And sometimes you'll say like, oh, the reader didn't look at my question. And sometimes the sheikh will just leave the question and not answer it. Uh, and that's normal, a normal part of studying. Like I said, if you get used to it now with Muhammad Tim, tomorrow, inshallah, you'll be very good when you go to sit with shuyukh and big mashayikh, you'll get used to it. That it's like that. But inshallah ta'ala, there was goodness in it and there was khair in it. Whatever I said that was good, I ask Allah Azza wa Jal, Yani, to make it beneficial to the people and ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept it. Uh, and whatever is, is true is from Allah and His Messenger. And if I said something wrong or I made a mistake, that is only uh, my own error. And Allah and His Messenger have nothing to do with that. Hada wallahu a'lam wa salatu wa salam ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.